let's talk about the regulation of, of urine volume. So those of you who have lab, last week you got to have my famous cocktails in lab, <laughs> right? Uh, so salt and water, some of you had baking soda, uh, you got to drink some, some really great things. Uh, and so we want to think about how does the body regulate fluid and how does the body regulate sodium, right? What, what's the process that's in, involved there? So let's look at control of sodium first and then we're going to look specifically at the, the volume. If we think of the, the sodium, uh, how much is going to be excreted, we can write a very simple equation. We can say that the sodium excreted equals the sodium filtered minus the sodium reabsorbed. Right? So what you dump in, the filtered, minus what you pull back, that's going to be the stuff that's excreted, right? that's going to show up in the urine. Sodium filtered minus what's reabsorbed equals sodium excreted. Well, the rate of filtering, the glomerular filtration rate, is really controlled by mean arterial pressure. Okay? So the mean arterial pressure controls glomerular filtration rate, and we've already covered factors that influence mean arterial pressure. We did that in the cardiovascular system, right? Blood pressure goes up, mean arterial pressure goes up, we're going to have increased filtration, right? And we know factors that can increase uh, blood pressure. So, that, the filtered part, is fairly constant. Really more important to us is the sodium that's reabsorbed. How do we control the sodium that's going to be reabsorbed? And it turns out that the reabsorption of sodium is controlled by a process that we talked about before, renin, right? The renin mechanism, renin angiotensin aldosterone, right? We, we've been there. So, what we need to do is to look a little more closely at where renin is produced and regulatory mechanisms that occur. So in this diagram, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, here's the afferent arteriole, here's the efferent arteriole, and not like what I've drawn or normally you see, but if you look closely, you can see the distal convoluted tubule is actually very close to the afferent arteriole. And so here it is magnified, right? So there's Bowman's capsule, there's the afferent arteriole, here's the distal convoluted tubule. And if we look closely, it turns out that the distal convoluted tubule has some specialized cells called the macula densa cells. Some specialized cells called the macula densa cells. And between the, the distal convoluted tubule and the afferent arteriole, there are some other cells here called the juxtaglomerular cells. Okay? The juxtaglomerular cells, oftentimes abbreviated as JG cells. Juxtaglomerular, what do you suppose that means? Juxtaglomerular. Near the glomerulus, juxtaglomerular. Right, it means near, so near the glomerulus. So these specialized cells, the juxtaglomerular cells, uh, are actually responsible for making uh, the renin. I'm sorry, what did you say the macula densa do? I haven't said yet, but it oh. turns out that those macula densa cells are going to be monitoring amounts of sodium that are in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay. So, uh, this process, uh, or this, this, these structures, the JG cells, the macula densa cells, allow us to monitor the sodium in the blood and the sodium in the, uh, the distal convoluted tubule. When sodium levels increase in the, the blood, the amount of renin released will be decreased. Right? So, sodium levels are going to go up, we're going to decrease the amounts of renin. Does that make sense? Right. So increase sodium in the blood, let's decrease renin, because we know renin stimulates reabsorption. So increase sodium in the afferent arteriole tells those JG cells, let the sodium go. When sodium levels start to rise in this area of the macula densa, they can tell the JG cells to increase their release of renin to try to bring more sodium back. 
So what about regulation of water? Okay. What about the regulation of water? Those of you in, in lab, right, you drank water, you drank water with salt, some of it was an isotonic solution. How do we regulate the volume? And it's not too hard to figure out that if you drink a lot of water, you urinate a lot. You don't drink much water, you don't urinate much, right? Well, one of the factors that influences this are some cells that we talked about in the hypothalamus a long time ago, osmoreceptor cells, right? So the hypothalamus has osmoreceptor cells that are there to help regulate the osmotic concentration of our blood. If the osmotic concentration starts to go down, you've got too much fluid on board, you're not gonna release as much ADH. Remember antidiuretic hormone? And so you'll let the water be lost. But if your osmotic concentration goes up, ADH levels will increase, you're gonna pull more water back. Right, we kind of went through this before when we were talking about the, the hypothalamus. So those of you that drank the really salty solutions, not only did you not produce much urine, you got really, really thirsty, right? Because the hypothalamus was saying, whoa, right? Osmotic concentration's going up. Let's hang on to as much water as we possibly can. What goes on to make, make the feeling in our mouth of thirst? I know somebody's pro question is what, what causes that sensation in your mouth? Somebody's looked at that. I have to say, I don't know. Maybe it's not known. I, I just, I don't know what causes the sensation, but it's certainly what we equate to thirst, right? Some of it's gotta be osmotic. The mouth gets dry, but I, I don't know the, the actual sense mechanism there. Um, well, we need to look at how we reabsorb the water. We need to look at something called the counter current systems, okay, counter current systems. How is it that we can bring back the, the water from our forming room? And it turns out when we look at these systems called counter current systems, we find that these are common systems found in the animal kingdom, right? Having counter current systems. They're certainly found in the kidneys, but they're found in other areas of the body and, and other organisms as, as well as just in the, the kidneys. Uh, one example that I can give you just in terms of trying to think of countercurrent systems is to think about a, a duct squirt for a minute. So we're gonna forget about urine for a minute and think about duct legs and duct feet. So there's the giant duct leg. When I was in high school, I used to go duck hunting quite a bit with my, my dad and, and friends. I know it's horrible, I'm a murderer. I happen to like to eat duck. Um, so we would go out uh, ungodly hours in the morning, get up three or four in the morning, go out and uh, sit in these duck blinds. It was freezing cold, ice oftentimes on the edge of the ponds, and you would see ducks out in the water swimming around. And I would see these ducks out there swimming around, and I used to think, gosh, how come they don't freeze to death, right? If I sat out there with my legs in the water, I'm gonna get hypothermia and die. And ducks actually have a warmer internal body temperature than you and I. And it's like, wow, I wonder how they do that. It wasn't until I got to college that I actually learned how it is that ducks are able to keep their legs in that water. And it's because they have a countercurrent exchange system. So if we look at how the duck's leg is set up, we find that the artery coming down to the foot is right next to the vein that brings blood back from the foot. And that is a very efficient countercurrent exchange system for heat. So that as the artery goes down into the foot, heat is lost to the venous blood that's coming back that's cold. So as we go down, the arterial blood gets cooler and cooler and cooler, and as the venous blood comes back, it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So there's actually very little heat loss to the environment because of this countercurrent exchange system. We have similar systems for our feet, nowhere near as efficient as for a duck. But for appendages, we do the same thing, right? Arteries and veins are pretty close together when you started looking at those things in anatomy. Um, 
In a camel's nose, they have a counter current exchange system for moisture, for water, in terms of uh, water vapor, so that when the dry desert air comes in, it's moistened by the air that's going to breathe, be breathed out during the next expiration so that they don't lose a lot of water vapor in what's going out and they moisten the air that's, that's coming in. So these are, are common systems, these counter current exchange systems. The kidneys have something that we call a counter current multiplier system that can multiply what occurs in this exchange system. And that's what we want to look at here. Uh, first, then we'll talk a little bit more about the exchange system. So if we take a look at what's occurring in the loop of Henry, and proximal and convoluted, uh, proximal and distal convoluted tubes, this diagram is trying to show you that the filtrate that's coming into the top of the ascending limb of, of Henley is 300 milliosmolar. Where have we heard that number before? Do you remember this? Isotonic, right? So it's isotonic. And as that fluid goes down into the, the descending limb here, water is going to be reabsorbed by osmosis. Okay? Water is going to be absorbed by osmosis. So this is water permeable. When we get down to the bottom of the tip of the loop of Henley, look what's happened to our osmotic concentration. 1,400 milliosmolar, almost five times more concentrated. How did it get so concentrated? Because we pulled water back, right, by osmosis. When we look at that ascending limb, we find that sodium is actively transported out. The chloride will follow by the, the charge, the net charge. And that ascending limb is impermeable to water. It doesn't let water leave. So we're going to start pulling sodium out and not let water leave so that when we get to the top of the ascending limb, we can get milliosmolars down to hypotonic level. Less than isotonic, so we can get hypotonic. Let's look at this other diagram here. So this diagram is trying to show you that the descending limb allows water to leave, but there's no active transport of sodium. By the time we get down here, we're very concentrated, right, very hypertonic, but the ascending limb is not permeable to water, but it actively transports sodium out. So again, that when we get up here to the top of the distal convoluted tubule, we can be hypotonic if we need to. As that ascending limb is going up and we're actively transporting sodium out, we're going to tend to concentrate the sodium in this area. Right? Does that make sense? We're, we're pumping salt out into these tissues. And so the, the surrounding area becomes very hypertonic, which again allows us to pull more fluid out of the, the filtrate. We call this a counter current multiplier. You see the counter currents, right? going down, going up. It's a multiplier because we're actively transporting sodium out and concentrating it into this area. So instead of like my duck leg, where it was a passive process, right? Heat was just moving from warmer to colder. Now we're actively transporting sodium and causing it to build up in this area deep inside the medulla. We come back up here, again, not water permeable. We come up here, and now we have variably permeable distal convoluted tubule so that we can make this now either hypotonic or isotonic if we want. But here's the, the real crux of it, if you will. We go into the collecting duct, and let's say that we're at 100 milliosmolar. As the collecting duct passes back down through this area of the medulla, 
This area is controlled by antidiuretic hormone. And if we need water, if we need to pull the water back because our plasma is hypertonic, we can release ADH and we can make our urine go to a concentration of 1400 milliosmolar. If you don't need water, you don't release ADH, and we can leave with a hypotonic urine. Let's look at this uh, another way. Fish that live in fresh water, they don't have a problem with holding on enough water. Their problem really is the opposite, right? They got too much water in their environment. So they can just produce a diluted urine all the time. But once animals started to become terrestrial organisms and leave the water, the kidneys had to evolve to some process that would allow us to hold on to water so that we didn't have to have fresh water all the time. You had to be able to concentrate your urine. This countercurrent multiplier system allows us to concentrate it. Some animals, reptiles and some birds, are amazingly able to do this. They concentrate their urine so much that they produce urine pellets, the white little pellets that come out of a, a snake, whatever you're looking at, right, a lizard. The white paste that comes out of birds and lands on your car, very concentrated urine. We don't have that ability. We don't make salt pellets, right, urine pellets. But we can get it to 1,400 milliosmolar. Emily? So basically, this whole system is to either release sodium, grab um, water, and then the collecting duct, duct is basically to get rid of the water so we can keep the water and we're getting rid of the concentrated urine. Is so the, this system is here so that we can make urine that's more concentrated than our plasma. Because if you think about it, if we didn't concentrate this, the best you could do would be make an isotonic urine. Right? I mean, if your plasma just was filtered, the best you would get would be isotonic urine. Well, you'd have a huge need for water each day if that was the case. By having the countercurrent multiplier system, we can concentrate our urine down to 1,400 milliosmolar. Not as good as reptiles and birds, but pretty darn good. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, metabolic water when we get to digestion and metabolism. But there are some mammals, like the kangaroo rat, that make essentially little urine pellets almost, uh, and they have incredibly long loops of henley, so they can get much more concentrated than 1,400 milliosmolar. 1,400 milliosmolar milli is almost five times concentration, the concentration of our isotonic. That's pretty darn good. Yes, Nancy. I know from my nephrologist that that's not good. Like it's it's really you're supposed to drink. Well, it's so. Is this good or bad? Well, it's really good that so that you can be away from water. Is it great to make your kidneys work that hard all the time? No. You want to drink extra water to allow the kidneys not to have to work so hard, pulling that back. But it allowed humans to get away from fresh water, right? So that we don't have to stand by the fresh water. Now we can carry our water bottles, but it didn't used to be that way, right? So you might go out for a day's hunting and come back and drink in the evening, right? So that you could get away from, from, from that. So uh, let's kind of explore that just a little bit. Let's say that you get done for the semester, right? And you say, you know, I've always wanted to go to Las Vegas. So you decide to go to Las Vegas, so you don't care that it's summer. You're driving down there, you're driving along with some friends, say, oh, look, there's a sign that says there's some special caves out at some miles off of this road. Let's go look at those. So you drive out there, it's wonderful. You come back and you realize that you left your lights on, right? Your battery's dead, and now it's 35 miles to back to the road. You don't have any water with you, right? And so, but you have some bottles, and so, one of you maybe suggests, well, maybe we should collect our urine and drink it. And the question that we have to ask here is, should you drink your urine if you don't have any fresh water? And the answer to that is really, looking at us right here, if your urine is less concentrated than isotonic, it would be good. 
So if right before you went and looked at the cave, you had a big, large drink of, of water or a soda, and your first urine that's going to come out is very hypotonic, yes, collect it and drink it. But if that urine is anything more concentrated than isotonic, all you're doing is increasing the solutes in the body. All right? You're going to increase the amounts of solutes. And so you should be drinking your urine if it's more concentrated. Let's say it's a similar question to you're out in the ocean, you have no water, should you drink salt water? And the answer is no, because it's more concentrated than your blood, right? And you're not gaining anything by drinking the, the salt water. Oh, so this is the countercurrent multiplier <coughs> system. What about the countercurrent exchange system in our kidneys? So we do have a countercurrent exchange system in our kidneys. And it's set up really by the peritubular capillaries that drop down into the area of the leukopenia. And these peritubular capillaries have a special name. We call them the vasa recta. And it turns out that what is exchanged here is sodium chloride, just like when we did the heat. So not shown in this diagram, but the capillaries coming in are very close to the first part of the capillaries going out. And so as we come in, sodium chloride can leak into those capillaries. And as they leave, they're going to lose sodium chloride back into that area. So this is a passive process. It's not active so that we don't haul the salt away from the tip of the loop of Henley. We are able to keep the salt in there and still have blood flow. So you see it's kind of like the heat that we were talking about. Salt leaks in into the capillaries going down. Salt leaks out as we start to come back so that we don't start putting out lots and lots of salt because we want the salt in that tip of the loop of Henley because we need it to right, absorb water from that collecting them. Okay. What about the regulation of potassium? Right? So we looked at the regulation of sodium, we looked at the regulation of, of water. How about the regulation of potassium? Well, we know from early in the course that there are sodium potassium pumps sodium potassium pumps, so that when we reabsorb sodium, we'll lose potassium, right? Potassium goes in the opposite direction. So as we reabsorb sodium, uh, for instance, in that descending limb of the, the loop of Henle, uh, in the, excuse me, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, uh, and in the, I, the proximal convolute tubule and the distal convolute tubule, we pull sodium back, Potassium will be exchanged, so that we'll lose potassium. So that helps to regulate potassium. There's another mechanism here. It turns out that if potassium levels start to increase in our plasma, right? So if we have too much potassium in, in our plasma, that potassium can directly stimulate the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. So we know aldosterone is controlled by renin. We know that mechanism, but here's another mechanism. Increased potassium levels can directly stimulate the release of aldosterone. And what does aldosterone do? It causes sodium to be retained, but potassium to be excreted. Right? So it will cause the loss of potassium. So let's say that you started to get too much potassium. You, um, somebody put in a, a salt substitute at your table and you, you put a whole bunch of potassium chloride on your, your meal. Too much potassium can directly stimulate the release of aldosterone. You'll start to pull back sodium, which you need, because that balance is critical, and you'll lose potassium. So we can regulate potassium by regulating sodium. Yes? So with severe de dehydration, like often you have rehydration therapies, and that's high electrolytes, like potassium is that when the body starts getting off balance? Yeah, so when we, in severe diarrhea, when you look at the colon, potassium ion tends to be lost in large quantities. And that's why you need electrolyte therapy. So that doesn't really have like a feedback loop? Like, it does, but the body can't keep up with it. Right? 
right? I mean, it's, I mean, if the body could keep up with it, you wouldn't have diarrhea, right? It would say, no, don't lose that. So, right, it's, this is a disease state. All right, so 